Dr. Kurt K. Hawkins joined BYU's faculty in 2003. His research interests include poverty relief programs of the Chavez Research Administration in Venezuela. The, you know, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this, the Circolis, he'll pronounce it. Circus Bolivius is what it looks like to me, but I'll let him pronounce it in Venezuela. And the political parties in Venezuela. He has a book manuscript under review at Cambridge University Press, and his other publications include the forthcoming Dependent Civil Society in Venezuela in Latin America Research Review, Populism in Venezuela, the Rise of uh, Chavismo, yet another word I did not know, Bridging Latin America's Digital Divide, Government Policies and Internet Access in Journalism and Mass Communications Quarterly, and Sowing Ideas, Explaining the Origins of Christian Democratic Parties in Latin America and Christian Democracy in Latin America, Electoral Competition and Regime Conflicts. Hawkins received a BA in International Relations with a Spanish minor, summa cum laude, in 1993, and an MA in International Area Studies in 1995 from Brigham Young University. And he received his PhD in political science from Duke University in 2003. So he is one of our own, a Kennedy Center graduate. We're glad to have him here speaking to us. And um, I will turn the time over to Kirk after I make one short announcement. At the end of Dr. Hawkins' um, address, typically we have some time for question and answer, and I imagine that we will have a little bit of time for that. During the question and answer period, may I remind you all to please wait until the microphone comes to you. Morgan up here will have a mic to bring around to you. The reason for that is these lectures are recorded and are available on the Kennedy Center website, and we want to make sure that we get not only Dr. Hawkins' answer, but your very insightful questions recorded as well for, pros for posterity. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kurt. Thanks. First, a quick correction. The book is not under review yet. Uh, well, I look forward to that day, though. Thank you. Um, well, how can we understand Hugo Chavez and his movement, or Chavismo? You know now. Uh, in, my in my address today, I'll present some of the core arguments and findings from my research on Chavismo in Venezuela. I argue that Chavismo can best be understood by using the concept of populism. After giving a brief history of Chavez and his movement, I'll explain what I mean by this word, populism, and show how it helps us understand Chavismo. I then conclude by giving several policy recommendations for governments that have to interact with Chavez, recommendations that differ a bit from what the policymaking community usually suggests. These have applicability not just to Chavez, but to populists from around the world and to our approach to problems of political and economic development more generally. Chavismo, also known as the Bolivarian Movement uh, in Venezuela, had its immediate beginnings in a conspiratorial organization in the Venezuelan Armed Forces called the Bolivarian Revolutionary Movement, or MBR 200. Uh, the 200 is for the 200th anniversary of Simon Bolivar's birth, that the organization is named for. It was first organized in December 1983 by Hugo Chavez and fellow younger officers trying to alter the inequities and corruption of Venezuelan society. The officers were inspired by a new nationalist curriculum being taught in the military university in the early 1970s, as well as their own middle class origins and by contacts that some of them have made with radical leftist groups from outside the army. Members of MBR 200 operated clandestinely biding their time while they moved up the military ranks, gradually increasing their numbers while they made plans for a civil military revolution. They accelerated their efforts after the armed forces were called in to repress the Caracaso, a massive riot in February 1989 that was sparked by a rise in gasoline prices following the initiation of an economic reform package. By the beginning of 1992, events seemed to have reached a climax for the movement. Most of the country was disenchanted with the government. The movement's leaders occupied positions of strength in the army, and there were increasing fears that the movement had been discovered by military intelligence. On February 4th of 1992, the leaders of MBR 200 attempted a coup against the highly unpopular administration of President Carlos Andres Perez, the president who had initiated the economic reform package a few years before. <coughs> 
Although the conspirators were defeated and strongly denounced by legislators and leaders of the traditional parties, they received considerable popular support. A decisive moment actually came at the end of the coup when Chavez, the leader of MBR 200 and the coup, was allowed to speak live on television in order to get other officers to lay down their arms. Chavez only spoke briefly, but his appearance, as one author puts it, contributed more to destabilizing Venezuelan democracy in two minutes than all the shots fired through the night. His youthful commanding presence, his homespun language, his sincerity and patriotism, his willingness to shoulder the blame for the failure of the coup, and his confident assertion that change would still come were a stark contrast with President Perez and the other well-known leaders of the national political parties. In prison during the next two years, the conspirators, and particularly Chavez, had the chance to reorganize and make new plans for the future while they received visits from numerous Venezuelans who idolized them or saw them as potential leaders of a new movement for political change. Although many of the former officers remained in the group, the emerging movement centered on Chavez and was increasingly civilian. The process of political organization accelerated after 1994 when the new president pardoned the conspirators and encouraged them and their allies to participate peacefully in elections. Some of the former officers immediately began to get involved in electoral politics, but Chavez and his closest allies maintained a defiant posture and remained aloof from elections. They took advantage of the next few years to undergo a, pro a program of self-education in the country's problems and its possible solutions, traveling around the country, meeting with Venezuelans, giving stump speeches, and studying books and ideas suggested to them by confidants. By 1997, there was a sizable group of civilian and military activists ready to organize for electoral competition around this broader project of democratic revolution. In October of that year, about 200 of them met in Caracas and signed the charter that legally organized the Fifth Republic Movement, or MVR, the party that would serve as the official electoral vehicle of Chavez and his allies. The movement's rise to prominence following the organization of MVR was rapid and exceeded the expectations of even its own activists. After a long, well-fought campaign that year, Chavez and his coalition won the presidential elections of 1998 with a sizable absolute majority of the vote. Over the next two years, Chavez and his coalition of supporters enjoyed tremendous success at carrying out the first part of their democratic revolution. They got voters to ratify a new constitution in December 1999 and won control of the entire government, all but a couple of governorships and municipalities over the next few years. At first, Chavez enjoyed high approval ratings, but by 2001, he began to lose popularity. Old comrades and moderate allies turned away from what they perceived to be an increasingly radical, personalistic project. As early as the 2000 elections, many of his former co-conspirators ran against him for the presidency. Business allies withdrew their support, and the media ran stories about what they considered the failures and corruption of a movement that had deceived them. By the first quarter of 2002, his approval rating had fallen below 40%. A coup in April 2002 briefly removed Chavez from power, and a two-month-long national strike by the opposition in early 2003 nearly destroyed the country's economy. Obviously, Chavez has recovered, and today his movement is strong. I could mention several factors that explain this recovery. Um, above all, his ability to take advantage of repeated opportunities to, to purge dissident members from his movement and assert greater control over the government. But one of the key elements in this turnaround was the government's social program that finally emerged in about 2003. In late that year, Chavez began sponsoring a series of innovative programs called the Misiones, or missions, that provided health care, education, basic, uh, I'm sorry, subsidized food, and occupational training and development loans for economic cooperatives. Ultimately, millions of Venezuelans benefited from these programs. The Misiones allowed oil revenues to reach the poorest members of Venezuela's population and made real visible changes in their long-term well-being, ideally equipping them to better compete in a globalized economy. Their political significance was just as great. By covering virtually every sector of economic activity with the Misiones, Chavez was able to construct a parallel state-sponsored economy without having to make painful decisions about redistribution. He essentially did an end run around the private sector and thus most of the opposition. And, needless to say, he won most of the elections that followed. These initiatives were made possible, of course, by the dramatic rise in oil, in oil revenues that took place after 2002, uh, from about $25 a barrel to sometimes $70 a barrel, as we all know when we go to the gas pump. And this yielded billions of dollars 
uh, billions of additional dollars for the Venezuelan government. Well, some of the oil boom uh, resulted from events outside the control of the Chavez government, such as the end of the global recession in the early 2000s. The government could take some of the credit as part of his approach to Venezuela's international relations, which emphasized alliances with countries opposed to the United States, Chavez and his key advisors began early in 1999 to form a new consensus in the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC. As a result of these economic and political successes, Chavez has now surrounded himself with a more radical set of allies and asserted ever more personalistic control over the movement and government. Bolstered by his repeated victories in elections, he is pursuing nowadays a new, increasingly leftist vision of revolutionary change, the so-called socialism of the 21st century, that emphasizes state-sponsored economic cooperatives, new forms of community organization, and local government centered on a program of community councils, and government ownership over key economic sectors. After the presidential election results were announced in 2006, Chavez announced the creation of a new unified Chavista party, the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, which all parties and movements allied with Chavez would be required to join if they wanted to remain a part of the movement. Chavez insisted that the party would require party leaders to be chosen by the rank and file, but these efforts have not yet fully materialized. At the presidential inauguration last January, he also announced his intention to renationalize key firms, including telecommunications and electrical utilities and foreign investments in the oil industry, and to end central bank autonomy. Shortly before, he also announced the punitive takeover of the country's largest private television station, RC TV, a fierce critic of Chavez and an alleged accomplice in the attempted coup of 2002. And he continued to pursue an aggressive international policy emphasizing regional political integration and international cooperation against the United States and its allies, relying for this effort on his international prestige and on the extraordinary sums of foreign aid that he paid for with the increasing oil revenues. Thus far, Chavez has gone through with all of these initiatives, despite considerable international criticism and a new wave of protest at home. Insiders suggest that these moves are part of the government's new grand strategy, the Plan Nacional Simón Bolívar, which will ultimately include further constitutional reforms, such as eliminating presidential term limits, a complete end to the private economy, and replacing the United States with China as the leading customer for Venezuelan oil. Now, Chavez, Chavismo is an extraordinary phenomenon that confronts us with a variety of questions. How has it managed to polarize Venezuelan politics and lead to an unraveling of the pluralistic democratic norms that once prevailed in the country? What explains the movement's extraordinary capacity to mobilize activists, hundreds of thousands of them, for key government initiatives and election <coughs> campaigns? What fuels Chavez's anti-U.S. policies and his bold attempts to bring together countries in a kind of anti-liberal democratic alliance? And what explains his colorful, inflammatory rhetoric, which many of us heard in his demonization of George Bush in his speech before the UN General Assembly? The answers to many of these questions, I suggest, is uh, to see Chavismo as an example of populism. What do I mean by that word? It's a controversial word to use in Venezuela and in much of Latin America, not to mention among social scientists. By populist, I don't mean that Chavez and his movement are demagogic, that they have short-sighted economic policies, or that they represent a particular step along the path to modernization, although Chavismo may be all of those things. Instead, I mean that Chavez and his movement have a particular political discourse or worldview that perceives history as a cosmic struggle between good and evil, one in which good is the will of the people or the natural common interest of all citizens once they're allowed to form their own opinions, and evil is a conspiring elite that has subverted this will. Wholesale institutional change, revolution, or liberation is required in order to restore the will of the people. Procedural rights, especially those of the opposition, may be treated as secondary concerns or mere instruments. Chavismo and populism, more generally, are not necessarily undemocratic. Chavez and his supporters see sovereignty resting in ordinary human beings and they argue for the expression of their will through elections and other mechanisms of direct participatory democracy. But Chavismo isn't pluralist. Dissent is not a valued permanent feature of politics, especially if dissent means disagreement with the goals of the revolution or the authority of Chavez. Pluralism is an alternative democratic discourse that sees differences of opinion as inevitable and maybe even necessary for democracy and values institutions of compromise or civil liberties that protect the rights of minorities. 
Within Chavismo, then, as within any populist movement, are the seeds of something totalitarian. History furnishes many examples of populism, of the political left and the political right. The populist movement in the 1890s here in the United States, which gives the phenomenon its name. Ross Perot in the early 1990s. Perón in Argentina. Vargas in Brazil. Velasco Ibarra in Ecuador. Mussolini and Hitler. Stalin. All are united by a similar discourse and worldview, although obviously the ultimate expression of this discourse in policy and political regime are very different across these movements. And each, each varies in the ideologies that it adopts to give specific content to this discourse. Chavez and his movement are paradigmatic examples of populism. My own studies carefully examine his discourse in speeches and interviews across 12 years in and out of government and find remarkably constant reference to populist ideas and language. For example, from his campaign speech in 1998, when he first won office. In less than eight days, we make the final assault to remove the corrupt elites from power. We are in the times of the apocalypse. You can no longer be on the side of evil and the side of God. Or from his closing campaign speech of 2006, eight years later, let no one forget that we are confronting the devil himself. Sunday, December 3rd at the ballot box, we will confront the imperialist government of the United States of North America. That is our real adversary. Not these has-beens here, these lackeys of imperialism. You, the people, are the giant that awoke. I, your humble soldier, will only do what you say. I am at your orders to continue clearing the way to the greater fatherland. These elements in Chavez's discourse are constant, much more constant than his use of radical leftist language, which is a relatively new feature that emerged over the past three years and correlates, not surprisingly, with his adoption of radical socialist policies. Moreover, Chavez's discourse has strong similarities to other leaders that we would consider populist, both current and historical, inside and outside of Latin America. My assistants and I have measured the level of populist discourse in the speeches of over 40 world leaders and found that Chavez stands with the best of them. Perón, Vargas, and today, Morales and Ahmadinejad, among others. Now, what do we get from defining populism in these terms and using it to describe pop, uh, Chavez? Does talk really matter, or should we be focusing on other attributes of Chavez's movement to understand it? Chavez's populist discourse does matter and helps us understand what he does. Let me give you one of the best examples I can, which is the Misiones, or social programs of his government. As I mentioned earlier, the Misiones were begun during the latter part of 2003 as part of the government's unfolding program of radical socioeconomic reform. They were the centerpiece of this effort, a series of development programs that received several billion dollars in funding. The Misiones were designed to benefit the poorest and most disadvantaged segments of the population with education, health care, subsidized food, and other assistance. They provided a social safety net and investments in human and physical capital and became part of the government's effort at restructuring the economy around socialist objectives. Now, the Misiones are unique not only because of their size and scope, but because of the way they were directly managed by Chavez and his cabinet. Most of the programs were funded through transfers of oil revenue, direct transfers from the state oil company, without any regular legislative budgetary oversight. The president controlled all of it. Moreover, detailed information on program allocations was rarely available to the public, and most decisions about funding and placement were made without any kind of scrutiny from other government agencies, the media, or opposition organizations. Thus, the Misiones constitute what, in the political science jargon, are euphemistically known as discretionary spending programs. Uh, during June and July of 2005, several BYU undergraduate students helped me conduct interviews with ministry officials that ran these programs, an on-site survey of approximately 140 aid recipients and workers, and a statistical analysis of program allocations across the country for three of these misiones. We found that the misiones display a number of attributes that failed to conform to the predictions of the existing political science literature on dis discretionary spending and conform better to a model that takes the government's populist discourse into account. Specifically, while the allocation of Mission locations across uh, Venezuelan municipalities do take into account some means-tested criteria, such as poverty, the locales are clearly targeted at what we call swing or undecided constituencies. 
partisan criteria are used in administering the Misiones, presumably to win more votes. Yet, program workers and participants on the ground were unaware of this targeting and genuinely insisted to us on the lack of any kind of conditionality for people to receive aid. And despite the concentration of the Mission locations in these marginal or swing constituencies, program participants within each Mission are almost uniformly supporters of Chavez. If program directors are targeting the Misiones for electoral purposes, why don't they tell people to vote for Chavez if they want benefits? And if they're targeting them at these swing constituencies, why don't they make certain that undecided, rather than core supporters of Chavez, actually get the goods? To most of my colleagues, these results make very little sense. To a populist, however, they do make sense. Populists want to reward the faithful, but they also want to win elections by large numbers in order to show the support of the people. They're also a little paranoid of the potential for opposition conspiracies to undermine their efforts at, popu at popular revolution. So they bend the rules before crucial elections and target their spending. But because they came to power as a reaction, a sincere reaction, to corrupt clientelistic governments that used to buy votes, they cannot and will not do the same openly. Still, the populist discourse leaves a powerful imprint on these programs, whether or not they know it. You can't go into a government building without being repeatedly confronted with Chavez's image or having to listen to government workers who sing his praises and speak like leftist revolutionaries. This means that very few members of the opposition or undecided voters, even in predominantly undecided constituencies, will ever want to use these programs. Thus, the populist discourse seems to trump even the material self-interest of politicians and voters. Another reason it helps us to see Chavez and his movement as populist is that it can help us identify the causes of Chavez's rise to power and his success. If you ask scholars who study Venezuela why Chavez came to power and was able to do away with the old party system, they would usually give one of three answers. Early in the 1990s, the lack of participatory democracy was seen as the overarching concern in Venezuela. Venezuela's corporatist system and its dominant parties were preventing the political participation of new social groups fa and failing to keep up with the growing efficacy of Venezuela's population. Unless the government and the parties were decentralized and soci civil society given a greater independent voice, popular dissatisfaction would grow and threaten the democratic system. After the ascent of Chavez, Economic voting became the preferred explanation for the breakdown in Venezuela. The idea was that Venezuela's prolonged economic crisis, and it was severe, nearly two decades long, was driving voters to opt for desperate solutions. The failure of the traditional parties to reform themselves and propose effective policies had resulted in their rejection at the polls and their replacement by new, more radical movements. Finally, standing outside these two explanations are macro-sociological ones, these focus on the devastating combination of a historically weak government and an oil-based rentier economy in a context of globalization and new political technologies. Uh, rentier economies that develop in countries with what we call low bureaucratic autonomy and capacity, such as Venezuela, have traditionally experienced entrenched authoritarian governments and political cultures that make representative democracy very difficult. Lately, these problems have been aggravated by the decline in traditional manufacturing sectors brought about by globalization, as well as the spread of technologies that make mass-based organization less essential for political parties. However, seeing Chavismo as populist points us to a very different answer than these three. Populism is a response to a political system gone bad, one that no longer serves the interests of the majority or does what we think a democracy should. It is a response to corruption. Do actual levels of corruption perhaps explain the rise of Chavez and of populism across the globe? The answer is yes. Those who voted for Chavez in 1998 were much more likely to mention corruption as one of the key issues they felt the next government should address. They were much more worried about the honesty of their candidates, and they were much more keen on constitutional reform than other voters. Chavez appealed to these voters because of his populist discourse. Perceptions of economic performance also mattered, but no more than these concerns about corruption and the honesty of leaders. The ability to contend with problems of globalization matters a little less, and concerns about participatory democracy mattered not at all. Indeed, corruption was a significant problem in Venezuela by the late 1990s. Like citizens of many Latin American countries, Venezuelans had always confronted petty corruption, bureaucratic graft, kickbacks on government contracts, nepotism, rewards to party faithful were endemic. 
All of this started to change in the 1970s, though, for the worse. The extraordinary revenues of Venezuela's first oil boom, and for them it was an oil boom, whereas for us it was a crisis, and the lax attitude of their government at the time opened the doors to corruption on a scale not seen since the worst days of the old caudillos. The public often complained about it, and in surveys they mentioned it as one of the most significant problems of the day. In 1998, Venezuela ranked 77th out of the 85 countries in Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index. It was the most co corrupt country in Latin America besides Paraguay and Honduras. When we look across countries, a similar pattern emerges. Examining the 40 or so countries where my assistants and I measured populist discourse, we found that the best predictor of populism was not economic performance or labor union decline, but corruption. Knowing Chavez is populist tells us a lot. Now finally, the other reason it helps us to see Chavez and his movement as populist is that it helps us to make better policy prescriptions. To begin with, it helps us to see that Chavez and Chavismo are unlikely to disappear or successfully moderate in the short or medium term. The economy in Venezuela remains one of the government's most vulnerable points, its Achilles heel. Yet the implication of populism is that Chavez's destiny is determined more by more than just the economy and how much he's overspending the government's budget. It depends on the credibility of his discourse. This credibility derives from his honesty and sincerity, his ability to sound and really be someone who hates corruption and injustice and believes in the people. Now, corruption within the Bolivarian government remains a significant problem. Yet, unfortunately for those who oppose Chavez, this corruption has failed to dent Chavez's reputation among staunch supporters. This is partly because Chavez himself, personally, has remained largely free of the excesses that plague other officials and even his own family members. And partly because he is among those speaking out the most against corruption in his government. So, barring exceptional corruption scandals that directly implicate Chavez, Chavismo is likely to have staying power, even in the face of severe economic crisis. The most likely trajectory for Chavismo will be like Peronism in Argentina. It will probably stay around a long time. Given this likely persistence of Chavismo, uh, not to mention the recurrence of populist movements elsewhere, how can foreign policymakers respond to the movement, its allies, or future populists? Well, we should acknowledge the obvious material constraints on Chavismo, such as Venezuela's short-term dependence on the United States and its significant yet finite oil revenues. We should also be wary of the totalitarian potential of Chavismo and its aggressive pursuit of these goals abroad. Chavismo and other populist movements respond to real underlying problems of democratic governance with an appealing, morally charged democratic solution. Although they often fail to resolve these problems and instead create new ones with polarization, institutional weakness, and weakened civil liberties. In a region of countries that experience very similar political and economic failures, populism is bound to be an appealing discourse. Certainly, we should take Chavez's talk and actions seriously. That said, most policy analysts still don't fully appreciate the unique qualities and centrality of Chavez's populist discourse in shaping his international relations. These scholars are themselves captives of their own pluralist outlook that subconsciously equates their perspective with democracy and condescendingly regards Chavez's worldview as a vaguely nationalistic, uncouth personalism. Identifying Chavez as populist forces us to question this understanding. We can sharpen our current prescriptions uh, or at least better appreciate the kinds of challenges that pluralist governments face in their relations with populist ones. Let me now suggest four of these prescriptions. First, be realistic, yet sympathetic. Any attempts by outside governments to grapple with populist movements in Latin America or elsewhere have to be realistic. Part of my argument is that populism is largely homegrown, rooted in problems of corruption and the rule of law that run deep and are embodied in a whole structure of institutions that are closely intertwined. Unless outside pluralist governments are willing and able to offer solutions, they're going to have to show some patience. This means acknowledging the kinds of injustices that populist governments are grappling with, but it also means acknowledging them with humility. In most Latin American countries today, corruption is not a feature of government that ordinary citizens relish, and it largely persists because of the almost insurmountable collective action and coordination problems that this kind of reform requires.
Citizens of countries that have the rule of law today, like here in the United States, should bear in mind that our own happier configuration of institutions are not really of our own making, but more often than not come as a gift from benign colonial powers, accidents of demography, or previous regimes and reform movements that had to make repeated attempts at change. Second, promote good governments. Policymakers and scholars are increasingly becoming aware of the need for institutions that enshrine the rule of law and protect property rights. Key multilateral lending agencies began this push in the mid-1990s with several reports on the need for better regulatory institutions and legal frameworks in countries undergoing market-oriented reforms. More recently, the Bush administration has jumped on this wagon by emphasizing corruption reduction as a key condition for development aid, particularly through its creation of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. These policy solutions, however, are still not fully fleshed out. Yet, the wealthy capitalist democracies have something to offer in terms of examples and material aid. As our scholarly understanding of the roots of the rule of law increases, these countries and organizations will be in a much better position to make realistic policy recommendations. Promotion of good governments may also provide a short-term tool for responding to populist governments such as that of Chavez. Populist movements come to power as an explicit response to corruption, yet they're typically incapable of creating the kinds of institutions or attitudes required to fix that. Populist governments that fail to live up to their promises of eliminating corruption need to be reminded and criticized for that. Even if populist regimes ignore the advice, and many probably will, uh, successor parties and movements may be better empowered to implement these reforms by having a pluralist discourse more readily available. Third, be sophisticated. Much as occurred in Latin America and U.S. relations during the Cold War, there's a tendency today for the United States to see every new government and contending candidate in Latin America as a potential Chavez, and to judge parties in entire countries using this one criterion. My argument is that populism more broadly is the greater concern, and that populism can take a variety of forms. Chavismo is only one instance. Insofar as Chavismo or any other future populist merits a response, Pluralist governments can be more sophisticated in their approach by identifying who is in or out of the broader alliance. We now have empirical tools for actually measuring the level and consistency of populism embodied by a leader or movement. By reading relatively small samples of text, we can quickly and pretty reliably determine who is a full-blown populist, who is half-hearted or opportunistic, and who is instead pluralist. There's no warrant for assuming that every leftist is a potential ally of Chavez or that all allies of Chavez share his populist views. Studying what leaders actually say gives us tremendous ability to predict what they will do and provides policymakers with tools for a much more nuanced approach to diplomacy. Fourth, finally, understand the rhetorical challenge. While policy analysts offer very different assessments of what is the appropriate response to Chavez today, all of them agree that Bush the Bush administration, and most other occasional adversaries of Chavez, such as former President Fox in Mexico or President Lagos in Chile, have never won the verbal sparring matches that result when Chavez's uh, audacious comments and his rhetoric push these leaders a little too far. My argument, oh, just so you know, then uh, George Bush is not alone in being unable to say anything that sounds good to Chavez. So my, my argument here helps us understand why this rhetorical battle is so challenging. Chavez's populist discourse and practices have a strong, sincerely held democratic core. Not only are the government's electoral credentials still fairly sound, but Chavez and his supporters see themselves, they really do, as enacting true democracy. This makes it difficult for the U.S. government or any other pluralist one to effectively criticize the Chavez administration on democratic procedural grounds. Those kinds of criticisms are shrugged off as evidence of our government's conspiratorial efforts to manipulate the people. And Chavista, Chavistas can always counter us by emphasizing the inevitable weaknesses of our own governments. Perhaps just as importantly, Chavez's populist worldview leads him to embrace popular language and, as we say, transgress the boundaries of diplomacy and decorum. Depending, of course, on who the particular, uh, what the particular culture of a country is, populists thrive on salacious wit, plain talk, or foul language that not only reinforces their sense of oneness with the people, but demonstrates their rejection of the corrupt elite. Pluralists, on the other hand, avoid crossing these boundaries because they think in a language of neutrality and tolerance, 
And if they do transgress them, they risk losing their credibility, among other pluralists. However, not speaking the language of the populist simply demonstrates the elite status of the pluralist. And this, too, can be paraded before the public's view as evidence of their distance from the people. This is a hard, maybe an impossible rhetorical battle for pluralists to win. Obviously, one solution to this problem is not to say anything in public, uh, except maybe in regular diplomatic fora, such as the floor of the General Assembly of the United Nations, where the standards of decorum are stronger and the popular audience is small. In such settings, populism turns to its popular language at great peril. This may explain why Chavez's 2006 speech before the UN General Assembly backfired on him, and why the Bush administration's muted response for once for once seems so effective. Yet this strategy is obviously not always practical and makes it difficult for a pluralist to effectively denounce violations of democracy and human rights, as some critics of Chavez recommend. Given these challenges, pluralists need to carefully consider when and how they respond to populist rhetoric. Ultimately, any pluralist will struggle to win rhetorical battles with Chavez or another capable populist unless he or she speaks with an equivalent sincerity and credibility. An empty rhetoric is unlikely to convince any audience and will be an easy target for populists. A bit of rhetorical skill can help too, of course. Uh, humor, folk wisdom, bold challenges, demonstrations of real concern, each of these have a place in pluralist discourse. But unless criticisms can be backed up by clear efforts to redress problems of injustice, few Latin Americans will feel compelled to listen. Clearly, the United States has a long ways to go before it can regain this credibility in Latin America. Now to conclude. Today I've argued that Chavez and his movement in Venezuela represent a classic case of populism. I've defined this tricky concept as a particular kind of democratic discourse or worldview. My analyses of speeches by Chavez and many other current world leaders indicate that Chavez is a paradigmatic populist leader who shares important discursive similarities with other leaders that the media and scholars regard as populist. This populism is more than just talk. It helps us understand how Chavez and his movement operate and why they've polarized Venezuelan politics. It also leads to a more precise set of policy recommendations that sometimes contradict the advice we hear about Chavez nowadays. The tools developed in this research have broad applicability. They not only allow us to understand Chavez and his movement or other similar movements in Latin America, but populism and pluralism, democracy, here in the United States or other wealthy democracies. Populism exists within every democracy and within all of us. Thank you. You can ask me any questions you want now. Hello. I'd like to thank you for your uh, presentation. Just one question. Um, you mentioned and you gave a quote of Chavez of uh, how he refers to America as the great devil, the great Satan. I was wondering if perhaps you could just go into more detail about why, where he's coming from, <clears throat> what, it, what, what has America done to deserve this hatred towards him? Well, as I mentioned, the populist uh, has to seize an enemy out there, uh, this, uh, this evil that's subverting the will of the people. And in the case of Chavez, uh, the identity of that enemy has changed over time. And that is one change in his populist discourse that we've found. Uh, specifically, when he first comes to office, the enemy is mostly the traditional political parties. And so that first quote I mentioned to you, it, it only focuses on those parties. Um, over time, that changed, and especially as a result of the coup in 2002, which Chavez and some of his close associates uh, wanted to blame on the United States, and they kind of, in their minds, constructed what had happened then and said, well, this is obviously all a CIA conspiracy to finally get rid of us. He, he increasingly then moved to this kind of international enemy. And uh, in Latin America, where populism, uh, right, populism has to appeal to some majority and, and wants to appeal to what is actually the majority of the people, uh, in Latin America, that's usually the poor. And that means you're probably going to head towards a leftist kind of populism. And if you do that, you're probably going to adopt a socialist kind of ideology and start to see the United States embodying capitalism as, as, as the enemy now at the international level. 
So that's, that's how I interpret that uh, uh, targeting of the United States. It's, I think, a, a pretty sincere thing. He really does see us as, as part of this elite that continues to undermine the interests of peoples around the world. Um, I'm trying to figure out what sorts of behaviors and discourses are sort of natural outgrowths of, of populism and which are sort of choices. So, for example, can you have rightist populists? Um, can you have uh, democratic? Uh, I guess you can't. You, you've, you've said pluralists and populists are sort of opposed, so I guess you can't have a pluralist populist. But, yeah. but can you have a, a rightist populist? Can you have a a somewhat less authoritarian populist. Um, can you help me understand what's the, what are the natural outgrowths and what are the, the choices? Sure, my argument about populism as a discourse, and I use that word carefully, is to suggest that there's something more, uh, you know, for lack of better words, uh, subliminal or subconscious about the way people think and express it. And so, uh, presumably, it's not something that a person necessarily chooses to do. They speak like a populist without knowing it. And that's why it's so effective to read a speech and be able to immediately see, oh yeah, this guy's a populist, I can see it coming through clearly, and he doesn't even know it. Or a pluralist likewise. They just use a certain language that expresses these uh, assumptions they have about how the world works. Uh, now ideas about leftism and rightism, we usually think of those as an ideology, which is something that's more conscious. A person adopts that language and those ideas uh, knowing it. There are books you can read uh, that will help you become a leftist or a rightist. And uh, so in the case of Chavez in particular, as I was saying, uh, his leftist discourse has become much more radical and it's pretty recent. It's just the past few years that that emerges. And I think that's probably something a little more conscious that he's doing as he tries to imitate Castro and, and adopt uh, the lessons of the Cuban Revolution that he sees. Uh, so I'd, I'd want to distinguish it that way. That, one of the outcomes of that then is you can have varieties of populism. Uh, as you suggest, uh, that you distinguish by the ideology you adopt. And so a right a populist uh, currently would probably be someone like uh, Lukashenko in Belarus, uh, who scored very high on our populism index, but you know, he doesn't talk about necessarily nationalizing industries or adopting the communism of the past. In fact, he kind of preaches against it. Um, and some of the, these uh, you know, tricky historical examples I use, like uh, Hitler and Mussolini, as you read their speeches, you, you would say, well, there's a populist discourse that comes through, but obviously they also have what we call today a, a fascist or this kind of rightist ideology that goes with it. So you can have right or left populists. Uh, your other question, can there be more democratic ones? This is a question I don't answer in my research, which is how come populism sometimes leads to this totalitarian outcome, these, these horrible cases I mentioned, and then in other cases it, it's a nice movement that seems to retain the democratic credentials and, and, and er thereafter we sort of celebrate it and look upon it fondly. Uh, the populist movement in the United States, right, from the 1890s is one that most people don't think of critically. Um, although if you read their speeches, by the way, you start to think, oh, is that what they believed in? Because <laughs> uh, they, they have that same language and it, they almost sound a little paranoid. Um, and um, uh, certainly they're, they're I, we would think of them as more democratic. Thomas Jefferson has these wonderful comments and speeches. You hear them and you say, sounds populist to me. Um, but no one would think of Jefferson as being totalitarian. So those are, it's a good question, which is why, why do they head that way sometimes? What, why do some movements then end up something much uh, short of, of democracy. I don't know. Do they start believing their own rhetoric? <laughs> yeah, maybe, that they really are the only people. I, it seems like maybe the presence of a charismatic leader to lead the movement, and, and not all populist movements have that kind of leadership. Um, but when you have one, I, I think the risk is probably a little higher that that can happen. I think you're going in a, a direction that I kind of wanted to move in as well. Uh, if populism is the explanation for, for Chavez, that is uh, populism as a movement and not him as a person, why aren't we seeing that in other countries that, uh, around Latin America that are even, uh, have more uh, economic problems, more corruption? Yeah, why isn't than, than populism the, happening yeah. every day? So, so, so I'm yeah. wondering, maybe it does come back to that charismatic leader type. Yeah, and my argument, this is something I tackle towards the end of uh, my work, which is, well, obviously levels of corruption, say, in Latin America are pretty constant over time, uh, but levels of populism aren't. At any given moment, you may or may not have a populist leader in that country. Um, and the best reason I have right now is that it probably does take, it takes a populist uh, 
uh, to uh, bring that movement together and help them win the election. And that kind of a person, uh, a good populist in the sense of someone who's a good, uh, is good at strategy, good at winning elections, who really sincerely believes and, and has those unique opportunities that Chavez did to, to become visible before the public, uh, that doesn't happen every day. And, you know, we're looking at Latin American countries with uh, relatively small populations sometimes. So it doesn't surprise me that it might be hard to have a populist every day who could do that. Um, Speaking as a political scientist, uh, we always hate those kinds of explanations because they, they seem uh, like they're not generalizable, right? It's, it depends so much on, on an individual kind of a thing. But that's the best I can do right now. You mentioned the importance of, of patience and the need for the United States to rebuild credibility in Latin America. Right. What approaches would you recommend to rebuild that credibility? Well, uh, if you look at what a lot of the policy analysts right now say, they'll tell you, they'll essentially hark back to the days of the 60s where we had a lot of uh, economic uh, aid programs in place. And I, I think those are still a great idea and there's a lot of good that can be done there. But to me, uh, the, the bigger problem is, is not so much the, the economic shortcomings, but the lack of the rule of law underlying that. And so if you wanted to both enhance credibility by showing, you know, we talk and we deliver and we care about you, but then do so in a way that maybe is going to have even greater impact, it would probably be much uh, greater emphasis on this idea of governance and the rule of law. The problem with suggesting that is that the policies for doing this are still poorly worked out. Uh, and if you talk to the people at the uh, aid organizations and the foundations that work with this, it's, it's pretty bad. They have some really narrow institutional fixes they try. They recognize there's a much deeper problem, and they don't quite know how to get around that. Um, so I, I think that's probably where it has to head, but what do you do in the short term? I'm not sure. Hi. Um, I want to know what's your prediction about what's going to happen if he's in actually going to, because he's think, well, he's going to change the constitution because he wants to be there indefinitely. So what's your prediction about it? Um, I don't know. I, th right now, Chavez has proposed a set of constitutional reforms that uh, capture some of what I was talking about in this, this sort of grand strategy he's put together, the Plan Nacional Simón Bolívar. Um, I, I'm struck by the fact that, from what I understand, I think he's probably overreaching with these reforms. They're, they're way too big, and I think even a lot of his supporters say, I don't want a president for life. And technically, of course, he would be up for re-election each time still, but everybody kind of knows that he wants to be allowed to be re-elected so that he will be re-elected. Um, and I think that troubles a lot of people within his own movement. And if it's troubling them, uh, and my sense from the few polls that are being done right now is this actually doesn't have a strong approval rating right now. Nonetheless, when I speak to Venezuelans who are in the opposition, they're very pessimistic, right? I mean, how could we possibly have lost every election against Chavez? There's no hope. Forget it. And I think, you know, I, I think they could win this one. Um, he's, he's, I think he's overstretched himself with this. It's just a bit too much. Uh, it looks very undemocratic and too personalistic. Um, so if I were the opposition, I would be galvanizing to say, we're, we're going to stop him on this one, and it'll be a blow to him. Um, I don't know, but I, I don't know if, if anyone else kind of sh shares that perception of what's going on right now. That, so predicting it then, I, I don't know. It uh, depends a lot on the kind of campaign the opposition mounts. If they give up, he maybe will win. Um, but even then, he might not. I, I don't, I mean, I've seen numbers like 60% of the people opposing these, these changes. That's a pretty strong opposition. Um, so we'll see. Was there any populism in uh, Santander, Gomez, Perez Jimenez, other dictators in Venezuela who came out of the Andes as a sort of a uh, cowboy figure? Yeah, the old caudillos. Um, in Venezuela, the only study of populism I do is of Chavez. So I don't even look back at very recent leaders, because we could also look, say, at the campaign speeches for Rafael Caldera in the, in the 93 election, where he, he seems to adopt a populist discourse there as well. Um, and so, so I don't know, looking back over time, one of the problems of this project is collecting speeches. Uh, 
And uh, it's actually more difficult than you think. A few leaders have lots of books in the library with you know, their collected uh, speeches and works. And most everybody else gets ignored. Uh, there's more in Latin America, but I'm going to need funding to go do that. So uh, uh, that's, that's, that's the next item, is to expand our research. No, I mean, we've got a, it's a great instrument for measuring this thing. It's, it's quick, it's easy. Students who've worked with me really enjoy it because you just get to read the whole speech. You don't do a content analysis where you count words or anything like that. And uh, it's very appealing. But, uh, but we do need more raw data. And uh, there's a real need for that. There are no collections, large collections, of speeches uh, by world leaders, let alone Latin American leaders, anywhere in the world that we know of. Uh, most people, most social scientists, don't take talk very seriously. They think it's just window dressing. 